All right, before I begin the video, I'm going to announce the winner of the Wax Canvas Apron and Zephyr Bundle Giveaway I did in partnership with Creative Restorations. As always, I will announce the winner and then two runner-ups in case the winner does not contact me. Here we go. The winner is J.S. Congratulations, J. And the first runner-up is David Caldera23. And the second runner-up is Robert123. As always, please contact me at theelegantoxford at gmail.com and make sure to put giveaway winner in the subject line. Thanks again for all of your support. Welcome to The Elegant Oxford. We specialize and offer premium shoe shines, dyes, and artisan patinas for a quality men's brands and help others to learn the art of shoe shining. Visit theelegantoxford.com for all of your shoe care and Saphir Madai Dior needs. Hello everyone, welcome to the Elegant Oxford Q&A where I'll be answering 100 questions submitted by all of you through Instagram and through YouTube. So this video is a lot more relaxed, it's less formal, we're just going to have some fun and answer some questions. So let's get started. Oh, and before I begin, I just want to apologize if I butcher some names here. Um, they're actually Instagram handles and YouTube names, so some of them I really can't pronounce. Some of them I just don't think make any sense. So I apologize beforehand, and uh, yeah, let's do this. Uh, so the first question is from that guy's shoes, and he asks, who are your shoe shining mentors? And that's a very, very good question. So I think my shoe shining mentors are definitely Kirby Allison and Justin Fitzpatrick. So when I first started shining shoes in 2017, um, I googled how to mirror shine a pair of shoes and Justin Fitzpatrick had a video on YouTube that I really enjoyed um, and it kind of taught me the, the, the basics of a shoe shine. And then later on, once the Elegant Oxford took off, I uh, was contacted by Kirby Allison. He flew me out to Texas and I saw him at the Hangar Project. We made a couple of videos together that are still on YouTube if you'd like to see him. And he really honestly mentored me through a lot. He taught me a lot. Um, it was just really great. He was the first person I met that was also a YouTuber and he was just so gracious and he helped me out and he gave me Saphir and he gave me a bunch of stuff. He, and uh, he's always just been a, a good person I really look up to. So those would be my two shoe shining uh, uh, friends, my gurus. But uh, for as for in terms of cobblers, I'd say Steve at Beatles Leatherworks is another one of my uh, of my mentors. He's always been there for me. He's always asked me, answered questions for me. Uh, he calls me, helps me out. He's a, a really good guy, and, and I really look up to him for his sheer skill. He's one of the most uh, skillful cobblers I've ever ever seen. And if you know Steve, then you would know that that's completely true. So. Next question is from Jed Dowling. What's been the most rewarding part of building the Elegant Oxford business? <sighs> That's a very good question. I think the most rewarding thing has been seeing my work be appreciated by other people. So I think a lot of people have really awesome hobbies, but um, they don't go past a certain point. I mean, a lot of people love them and they're awesome, but when Millions of people get to see your work and they like it. It's just a really amazing feeling. Um, it makes me feel like I'm doing something that matters. And another thing that's really been amazing about the Elegant Oxford is that it's allowed me to spend a lot of time at home working from home, spending time with my family, my wife, and my daughter. So that's just been something I could, you know, that's just so amazing. I, I don't think there's anything in this world that could take the place of you know, family time and, and time together. So that's just something that I've really loved to experience with the Elegant Oxford. And thanks to the Elegant Oxford, I've been able to do that. So great question. Thanks. Timon Lesamon asked, what is your favorite shoe that you own? That's a really hard question. So I have a lot of shoes that I absolutely love, but if I had to choose the one that I like the most right now, the one that I wear the most, it'd probably be the Field Boot by Carlos Santos. Now, uh, I really wanted the Galway by Edward Green, but it's a $1,600 boot, and it's just an amazing, beautiful boot. So I looked around for copycats or boots that looked just like it that were a lot less, and Carlos Santos has the field boot, which is basically identical for a lot less. So I found it over uh, at the Noble Shoe with Costas. If you know Costas, he's really awesome, and he, he has an amazing website, with, and he sells really amazing shoes. And I got the, the field boot from him, and it's my favorite boot. I wear it all the time. I love the suede and the calfskin together. I have a video about it too if you'd like to see, but it's my favorite boot. I, I just love to wear it. Um, I have shoes that are of a higher quality and you know all that, but 
I just really love it. It's my favorite. All right. Simon M473 asked, how do you patina without leather dye? More wax or more cream polish? Okay, so I don't recommend you try dyeing or doing patinas without leather dye. If you really wanna use wax or cream polish, I recommend you use cream polish, something a couple of shades darker. Wax doesn't have a lot of pigment, so it's usually you know not a good idea. It doesn't really work out in, in the long run. So if you are gonna do a patina using uh, cream polish, make sure it's just two, two shades darker, no more than that. I think you should be fine. Oh, he has another question. What is your favorite budget shoe brand and why? So I think my favorite budget shoe brand would probably be Mir Min. Now Mir Min costs $195 brand new and uh, their boots cost about $250 and they make really beautiful looking shoes with a lot of fine details. They aren't perfect, obviously. I know there are horror stories from Mir Min, but I've had a really positive experience with them. And I think for the price, they are very hard to beat. They have closed channel stitching and the lasts are really modern and forward thinking. And their Linea Maestro line, which is about uh, $320, is hand welted with JR Soul stock from the factory. So that's just really amazing. I think it's really hard to beat. Sensation Holton asked, do you have any general tips on how to evaluate a cobbler before handing over a quality pair? That is a really great question. So if you have a really quality pair of shoes, you don't wanna hand them over to a cobbler who might mess things up. We've all seen horror stories on Facebook where someone you know, gave a cobbler a really nice pair of shoes and they came back totally trashed or they weren't even Goodyear welted anymore. They were, the, the, the soles were glued on. Uh, you just hear a lot of horror stories. So I think a really good way of evaluating a cobbler very quickly and this isn't the perfect method, but just as the method I use is I ask them if they know what JR soles are and if they know what metal toe plates like Lulu or Triumph toe plates are. If they've never heard of that, usually it's just a sign that they may not be at the level that I need for my shoes. Now that's not you know a blanket statement. I'm just saying that's uh, something you might want to try out. So if you meet a cobbler, ask them, do you know what JR soles are? And if they're like, and if they know, yeah, JR soles all that, they're probably up to date on what you would like. And if not, they're probably a little too old school and they might not be what you're looking for. Mark Challen asked, if you only had one pair of shoes left to shine forever, what would it be? Whew. Okay, so I have the answer. It would be a black pair of shoes. And that's because when mirror shining, black shoes always look the shiniest. A, a, a black, I don't know what it is about black leather. It just reflects everything so perfectly. So it'd probably probably be black so that I can look at the mirror shine and, you know, be proud of myself for my work. <laughs> okay. Traveling as a way of life asked, do you provide service to overseas customers? If yes, then please check your DMs. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, I do do work uh, for customers overseas. I've had some from the United Arab Emirates. Um, some from the UK, and I, I don't do a lot of jobs simply because shipping can be a complete nightmare. Um, I had a customer from South Africa who sent me a pair of Gaziano and Girling, uh, the St. James II, and it was over $300 to ship them back. And I went to multiple stores. I checked FedEx, UPS, and all that, and it was over $300. So uh, I do, and um, yeah, it just uh, depends on the person, how they contact me, what, what work they want, if they're willing to pay for shipping. Rudiger asked, do you prefer a calfskin or shell cordovan? <laughs> That's such a hard question. I love both. I love shell cordovan a lot. It's just so beautiful and it looks different than calfskin. And it, right now it's super popular. If I only had to choose one forever, it would definitely be calfskin. And even though I love shell cordovan a lot, calfskin is classic and it's definitely hard to replace. So calfskin it'd be for me. OMG, it's... We Weishing asked, after using Reno Matte or Acetone, how long must your shoe rest before shining? With Acetone, you don't have to wait very long. It usually evaporates in seconds, and it doesn't, you know, you, you don't need more than that. If you're using Reno Matte or Decapont, you might need to let it rest overnight for everything to dry completely, and you can always use a hair dryer to speed up the process. But Acetone, no need to wait. It, it evaporates in seconds and uh, should be fine. Style Journey of Chris asked, what drew you to shoe shining and why did you choose to do it professionally? Great question. Um, I grew up and watching my dad shine shoes, so that was always something that was part of my life and you know, dressing up and all that. What drew me to do it professionally was, it was just completely by accident. Um, I started by shining a pair of shoes and uh, kind of took off from there. People would ask me to shine their shoes because I posted pictures on Facebook. I really didn't choose to do it. It kind of chose me and that's, 
kind of how it happened, and it was completely by accident. W. Matt Tinch Esquire asked, what is the one shoe you've always wanted but have never been able to find? And <laughs> this is a funny question. There are two shoes that I've been looking for for years but I've never been able to find. One is the Floresham Imperial Concord, which is the king of all long wing gunboat models because it had uh, four V cleats, so two on each heel, and had certain stylistic elements that I thought that I think are fantastic. It's incredibly rare. I've only seen a couple ever for sale, none in my size. And the other shoe is even more rare, and that is the Johnson & Murphy Handmade 100 line. And uh, I've never seen one ever for sale anywhere. And in the 1990s when they came out, they retailed for over $1,000. Um, I've actually seen the uh, the shoe catalog from the 1990s. They were $1,000. So incredibly rare. It had spade soles. Uh, it had, you know, it was just a hand-welted, hand-lasted, handmade shoe. Incredibly rare. Probably the best shoe ever made in the United States, and it's completely rare, and I've always wanted one. All right, Kirsten Cares asked, do you have any secret talents? Whew, okay. I mean, I play guitar and sing. Not very well, but I do that. I think, I, I don't know, I just go around. If you ask my wife, I spend my entire day doing voices, like, from anything, whether it's cartoons or movies. I just love doing voices. It's like my favorite thing to do. I'm literally always, I'm not gonna do anything right now, I'm just way too embarrassed, but I'm always going around impersonating Optimus Prime, or if you know Metal Gear, Solid Snake, I'm always like saying something in his voice, and that's just what I like to do. So a lot of people have told me I should go into voice acting, um, so who knows, that's just something. Um, who made your gorgeous leather apron, she asked. Uh, my leather apron was made um, by a company in, uh, they're on Etsy, they're called Kruk Garage Workstyle from the Ukraine. K-R-U-K, Garage Workstyle. And I contacted them because I, I loved the way their vest looked. And I asked them if they could put my logo, my company logo on there, and they did. And it's my favorite thing ever. I was just tired of getting leather dye and all that on my clothing. That can get annoying. Oh, she asks another question. Any lady boot blacks that you admire or recommend? So. Uh, a, a boot black is a shoe shiner for those in the U.S. It's not a word we use very often. So are there any female shoe shiners that I admire? And yes, I absolutely, there's one that I, I think is absolutely fantastic. Her name, I'm looking it up right now, and I hope I don't butcher her name because she's just so talented. Her name is Natalia Diad Diadkina. Okay, she's the Russian champion shoe patina contest winner in 2019. Mm -hmm and she is phenomenal. She is far beyond anything I could ever hope to do with patinas, and I really admire her work. She's absolutely fantastic. So uh, I'll leave her link or, or something down below so you can check out her work. She's very, very talented. <clears throat> okay, the real 707 asks, why don't, you, why don't you reply to Instagram messages or emails? That's probably the most common question I get, and the truth is I'm just a one-person show, and I get hundreds of emails, messages, texts, everything, you know, notifications per week. So when I wake up in the morning and check my phone, I am completely, it's completely full of just people trying to contact me. And I feel bad because I just don't have the time to contact everyone back. I wish I did, I just don't. If I did, I'd be at my phone all day. And I'm really, really busy with my wife, my kid, my business, all this. So. I really apologize. I'm not trying to ignore anybody, and, and I'll try to get back to you. My only piece of advice is to just keep be, be tenacious, keep contacting me, keep pestering me, and I will get back to you. Braxton Matlock, is there a good way to prevent leather shoes from absorbing odor from cigar lounge? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, I haven't found a method yet, so if you like cigars, I think it's reasonable to expect that your clothing and your shoes are going to smell like cigar. So my recommendation would be just I don't know. Don't wear don't wear shoes that you don't want that smell to get on to a cigar lunch. Probably the best piece of advice I could give you. D Cheney 19 asked, "Is shoe shining a dying art in a throwaway society? If so, can it come back?" Um, I think shoe shining is definitely not as uh, common as it was. I don't know, 50 years ago. I, I know everyone used to shine their shoes back in the day. It's definitely not as common, but I don't think it's dying. I think we're seeing a renaissance, a resurgence, a, a new life being brought into the movement. Um, Instagram, YouTube, I think there's a lot of that going around right now. So I don't think it's ever going to die. 
um, I think it's just going to be there for those who want to look for it, uh, along with dressing up and, and all those other sartorialist likes, like shoes and clothes and all that stuff. Sergio Aom asked, what is the importance of a developing man to know how to shine his shoes? I think learning to shine your shoes is important because it teaches a person to care about the way they look, to focus on the, on the small details. I think that's probably the most important part. That in turn can be taken into other aspects of your life, like your health. Um, you know, the sky's the limit. You can really take that and, and, and apply that everywhere else. And I think you should. I think a, a, a gentleman should be responsible, accountable, and hardworking. Shining your shoes is just one of those things that allows you to look your best. So there's nothing, I think it's an important thing to do. Ibrahim Kokar5 asked, can we use black polish to make a light colored shoe darker? Yes, you can. But now that I've gotten better at shoe shining and all that, I don't think it looks very, very good at all. So if you use dark brown polish on a tan shoe, it's just gonna look like your shoe's dirty, really. I mean, it can look okay, but I just don't recommend it in the long run. But if you wanna do it, um, just make sure the contrast isn't too stark. And if it's pebbled grain leather, you're gonna get a lot of dark polish in between the grain. It's gonna look really, really bad. So just avoid that. Toblerone7557 asked, have you ever considered one day opening a real retail location like Kingsman, but for shoes? Uh, yeah, sure. I think, I mean, right now the Elegant Oxford, I don't think is, is at the point where I can open a retail store, but at, sure, at some point, I would hope that I could open a retail store so people could come visit and all that. So definitely a great question. And I hope that one day I can. Futterbucker asked, if you could, would you ever consider making shoes? Absolutely. In fact, there is a uh, bespoke shoemaker out on the East Coast named Marcel Marsan. He's on Instagram and he is a bespoke shoemaker and he's absolutely fantastic. And he offers courses and I, I, I thought about going out there and learning how to make a shoe uh, just for fun, just so I could increase my skill, learn more about shoes and so I could tell people, hey, I made this pair of shoes. So one day in the future, I hope to learn more about shoes and shoemaking. And that's definitely something that's going to happen. Right now, it's just not the best time to travel and do all that. But yeah, absolutely. CBG36 asked, is it possible to obtain a mirror shine on a corrected grain pair of leather shoes? Yes, you actually can. And that's kind of how I started practicing my shoe shining technique. I would get shoes from the thrift shop in practice, and a lot of them were corrected grain. And it's not the best leather, but you can definitely get a mirror shine on them. And sometimes because it's like already pretty shiny, it looks even shinier but you can definitely do it. Intro Clues asked, have you noticed a recent increase in popularity or interest in quality shoes and boots? Definitely, there is a sector of Instagram, there is a part of Instagram where I've seen a, a complete renaissance in, in, in this desire to seek after quality shoemaking, or it may be that all the people who have that desire are now uh, coming together to make groups uh, to, to, to make Instagram pages where you can see some amazing work. There are bespoke shoemakers coming out of China, um, out of places you've never heard of, and they are making some quality shoes. Uh, hand welted, hand lasted, really great stuff. Uh, one of them that comes to mind is uh, Yeosol out of Shanghai, and they make an amazing shoe for an amazing price. Actually, that's coming up in the review series, but as soon as I saw their work, I was completely blown away. I was told about them by my friend, Vladimir Riche, and I was completely shocked by what I saw. They do spade soles, hand lasted, hand welted, and all that. So definitely uh, something that I like seeing now. And we're seeing a lot, a lot of more shoes come out. Another one that I saw on Instagram recently is Gordon Jim June. Blown away by the work I'm seeing on that from from Instagram. So uh, yeah, definitely seeing uh, some good stuff coming up. Dale Stafford asked, "Have you considered participating in the World Shoe Shine or Patina Championship in London?" Absolutely. Um, I'm not a great patina artist, I would say. I'm just a fair, I'd say, probably better than novice, but not great. Um, I am way more confident in my shoe shining skills. I, I've actually pulled off some mirror shines that I am very confident. Not that I would win, but that would, you know, I would be a strong competitor if I could replicate that regularly. Um, I'm still improving my technique, but I'm, I'm definitely interested in entering one day. Agrus asked, how has YouTube changed your life? How do you feel about so many people supporting your channel? So YouTube has changed my life. It's allowed me to, I don't want to use the word celebrity because that's not an appropriate term. I don't believe myself to be a celebrity or anything like that. I'm just a normal guy. But it does come with a, a you know, 
popularity, I guess, of being a YouTube influencer. People listen to what you say. They look to you for advice. That's That's been a source of, of change in my life. People have recognized me on the street. Um, a lot of friends are like, wow, I can't believe you do YouTube. And a lot of, especially the younger generation, when they meet me, they're blown away that I'm a YouTuber and their parents really don't know what that means. But uh, it has been, a, a, it has changed my life significantly. I can stay home and work and, and make a living and all that. So it has changed my life for the better. And I am really grateful for all of you for helping to make that a reality. DJ Bo Knight asked, Shoe shining is therapeutic for me. What makes it special enough for you to showcase it? Um, I never planned on showcasing it really. It kind of just happened. So I do think it's, com I do think it's special for sure, but I think um, I showcase it because people want to see it. If the day comes and no one wants to watch it or see it anymore, I'll just do it personally like I did before and that'll be okay. But yeah, I do it because people want to see it too. So that's why my YouTube channel is where it's at because people do want to see it. Victor Murph asked, what is your favorite made in America shoe beyond the traditional Alden and Allen Edmonds? So that's a great question. Unfortunately today, the only two companies that still make a, a made in America shoe are Allen Edmonds and Alden. And right now, I still love Allen Edmonds, but they're going through a, a period where I think they're struggling a little bit. Alden still makes a very amazing shoe and I really, really like it. But unfortunately, neither brand compares to what used to come out of the United States back in the day. And if you just look at the Floorsheim Imperial from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, just completely amazing with 50 nails per shoe really solid craftsmanship. And if you go into the older day, into the 20s, you saw hand-welted, hand-lasted spade soles, beveled waist, fiddleback waist, really amazing stuff. So unfortunately, there is no other brand aside from Allen Edmonds or Alden that currently make an amazing shoe. You'd have to go Best Bespoke. You'd have to go to Marcel Marsan or something like that, or another Best Bespoke maker. And there are some, but I don't know all of them. So unfortunately, there's no other brand. If you like American shoes, I would you know go on eBay and look up vintage stuff. You can always check out vcleat.com. David is a wonderful resource for all things vintage shoes, and he's, a, in my mind, a great shoe historian who I really admire. Okay. Cheesy Gringo asked, what is the biggest mistake you've ever made with shoes? A botched job, bad purchase. Botched jobs, uh, no botched jobs. I did go to a, a client's house to patina a pair of shoes. This is actually on video in one of my videos. And I knocked over uh, a dye bottle all over his table. He was so gracious, it, you know, he was, didn't even, you know, he was really, I just have to say he was really nice about it. Um, bad purchase, I've had no bad purchases. I've been happy with every shoe that I've purchased so far. Uh, the only thing that sucks is that I, I recently bought a pair of Crockett and Jones um, Shell Cordovan bluchers that I've been looking for for a very long time, and they really don't fit me that well. But they're a really beautiful shoe, and I'm going to keep them for content creation and all that. So, not a bad experience at all. The seller is fantastic, and I have a good experience with them. So, uh, Matt. So 0211 asked, difference between Horween Shell Cordovan and Shinky Shell Cordovan preference. Um, in my opinion, Horween is the standard for Shell Cordovan. The absolute best Shell Cordovan is by Horween in Chicago, but there are other tanneries in Italy and in Japan, I believe, that make Shell Cordovan. I don't think there's anything wrong with them at all. I think that Mir Min uses them and other, other brands use them. Um, yeah, I don't think you can go wrong. They're obviously less expensive, than Horween Shell Cordovan, which is quite pricey. But overall, I think it's fine. I mean, if the shoe was constructed well and the shell is intact and there are no rips or tears or wrinkles, you should be completely fine. I've heard good things. Mitch Farrell 6 asked, how do you repair damaged leather from too much time under the hairdryer? Unfortunately, if you've burned your leather, like if there's actually burn damage from a hairdryer or a heat gun, um, I don't think there's anything more you can do to remedy it. Um, if the leather has a hole, like if it's been burned through, obviously there's no fixing. If it's just black, like it's been charred, you could probably try dyeing your shoes black. But aside from that, there's really no method or fix that I know of, unfortunately. Al Fisher too asked, what pair of shoes got you interested and into working on shoes? Fantastic question. So the pair that I've always had my eye on since I was probably 16 or 17 was the Strand by Allen Edmonds and Walnut. I would see it in, in magazines and I think I first saw it in GQ. There was an article that just had a picture of it. I thought it was such a beautiful shoe. It captured my attention immediately. And I looked up, you know, how much it cost. It was, it's three ninety five on the Allen Edmonds website. I just didn't have that kind of money back then. So I just didn't but I, I thought about that shoe for many, many years. And in 2017, when I graduated from college, 
I bought that shoe. It was my big, my first big boy shoe purchase. So it's the shoe that got me into everything. It's the Allen Edmund Strand and Walnut. So it's a shoe I absolutely love. To this day, I still completely am in love with that shoe. So I guess that would be my first love. Michael Lopez 02 asked, golden age of shoemaking, why? Okay, great question. And I've talked about this before, but in my opinion, the golden age of shoemaking uh, was in the United States from the 1920s till about the 1990s, where a lot of these amazing heritage American brands made some of the best shoes you will ever find on earth. Now I know in, in Italy and in the UK, they've been making amazing shoes forever, but I really, really, I, from what I've seen in the US, there was a lot of this American pride to make the best shoe possible. So these companies were going all out to make the absolute best handmade shoes you could find for the money. And some of these shoes are just, just blow me away. And there's nothing today that I've ever seen that can match what I've seen from these vintage finds. Incredible fine details, incredible construction, incredible materials that you just don't see anymore. Um, so in my opinion, that was the golden age. In the 1990s, as shoes became a little less popular and companies were worried about, you know, making money, they they switched production overseas and all that was lost. The only two companies that still sur that survived this onslaught <laughs> were Allen Edmonds and Alden, and I think Alden's doing just fine. Um, Allen Edmonds, in my opinion, is a great company, but there are some things that I'm not too happy about. But other than that, I love Allen Edmonds, so don't take that as an attack. They're still one of my favorite brands. Normand Cardea asked, what is your favorite color to work with? Uh, my favorite color to work with is brown because it comes in a lot of shades from light brown to medium to dark and it's just a fun color to experiment with and it's very, very beautiful. So I always like seeing browns. It's just so warm and regal. It's just one of my favorites. Okay, Brady Souther 45 asked, what will be the first proper dress shoe you buy for your children? Um, my son is due in May, so It'll, I'll either wait till he gets old enough so a shoe fits him, or I'll contact someone, maybe, I don't know, one of my contacts to see if they'll make me a shoe for a kid that small. Um, so who knows what it could be. So I'll reach out at some point and do that. I've always had, you know, wanted to do that. So uh, D Patel 100B, how is your mental health? Uh, it's fine, <laughs> but I should probably take this chance to uh, um, tell you if anyone is struggling, you should, you know, there's no shame in getting help. I know I've uh, we've all had our struggles. Everyone's just trying to do the best they can. So, um, yeah, if you're going through a hard time, don't be afraid to reach out to somebody. I mean, I think what's going to happen is you, you'll suffer till it's unbearable. Then you'll get help and you'll realize I should have done this a lot sooner. So yeah, I mean, there's no shame. I think we should treat mental health struggles like we treat high blood pressure or a broken ankle. It's just part of being human. We all struggle. We're all doing the best we can. So yeah, that's just all I have to say about that. So to Juana 33 asked, why are you so handsome? Thank you, honey. Um, that's funny. So my, my wife actually likes long hair. She She's like always had crushes on guys with long hair. And there's a funny story I'll tell later. But uh, when she found out it was bald, she was like completely shocked. Okay. Callie Ulfer 2 asked, are you religious? So normally I don't speak to about politics or religion on my channel, but it's just a Q&A. So yes, I am religious. Uh, I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, for those who don't know, from the year 2009 to 2011, I served as a missionary in Tampico, Mexico, which is on the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> and uh, it was a life-changing experience for me. Um, I lived there. I didn't come home for two years. And uh, for those who, you know, don't know what missionaries do. Um, I actually had multiple assignments. One of them was being an immigration secretary for the entire mission. So I took all the missionaries to immigration whenever they came in, brand new from the mission. Um, I took them through immigration, got their visas, renewed them down in Mexico City, you know, sending them down by mail every year. And I was also my mission president secretary for six months, uh, which was another really amazing experience. My mission president was vital in helping me to develop myself into the person I am now. I barely graduated high school with a 2.0, and my mission president, who's the only adult really looking after these 319 year olds, um, he really instilled within me the values of hard work and seeking an education. So I really want to thank him. I haven't seen him since, you know, for over 10 years, but he was just an amazing person. He was a marathon runner. Um, 
He was just incredibly intense and hardworking. It was crazy. He was like 55, but he had more energy and more drive than any of the missionaries in the mission. So I always really looked up to him. And then the rest of my year and a half were, were spent in various cities. One of them was Monte in Tamaulipas, which is a tiny, tiny little town in the middle of nowhere, um, surrounded by sugarcane fields. They actually had a Coca-Cola factory in Monte um, where they would harvest the sugarcane for the Coke. And uh, that was a hard assignment. I was there for nine months. And that area, which I really look back on fondly, was the nine months that turned me into who I am now. It was a very difficult assignment and it really forged me into the person that I am today and instilled within me the values that I still have to this day and who have made me the person that I am today. So um, I really value uh, the church, I really value my faith, and that's one of the most important things. It's my worldview. It's the thing that I use to interpret everything in my life. So yeah, that's what I am and that's who I am. If anything, it's, uh, it's that important to me. Okay, Brad the Bear asked, how did you meet your wife? Okay, <laughs> this is actually one of my favorite stories to tell. So, um, where do I start? It's actually connected to the previous question. So, in the church, if you are unmarried and from the ages of 18 to 31, you're considered a young single adult. So they're called the YSAs. And every year in San Diego, the YSAs, we rent out a huge 500 person yacht and we take it out into the bay for Halloween. And this this huge yacht has three store, three floors and each floor has a dance floor. So it's this huge Halloween dance. And we take it out from like 10 at night till four in the morning. So it was October, 2014. And we were all going to this boat dance. So people from Tijuana to Los Angeles come to this dance, it's huge. And uh, we were all going to this boat dance, me and all my friends and I needed a costume. So for those who don't know, I used to be a Jack Sparrow impersonator. So I would dress up like Jack Sparrow and go to Comic Cons. And I did this for many, many years. I had a really great costume. Here's a picture of me dressed as Jack Sparrow. So um, I had a lot of fun and I did this for years, but that year I needed a costume. I didn't have one. And since Jack Sparrow was a always a fan favorite and all my friends really loved it, I wore it to, the, to this Halloween dance and uh, it was really popular and everything. And then my wife who was attending that dance also she wanted a picture with me. She saw me and was like, I want a picture with that Jack Sparrow guy. And we took a picture together and here's the picture. So that's kind of how we met. She had me on Facebook and, and all that. And she tagged me in the picture. And then uh, a couple of months later in December, my best friend, who is now an attorney, he actually married uh, this girl. He got a girlfriend um, who later became his wife and he had less time for me. So every weekend I'd go over and we'd watch, we'd watch Lord of the Rings or we'd watch Doctor Who or... Star Wars were huge fans, and he just had less time, obviously, and I think that's totally fine. And I told myself, I need this, I need a girl that I can hang out with on the weekends, um, that I can hang out with, so I just, I'm not so lonely. So I thought, who's gonna hang out with me? And I thought, oh, that girl from the boat dance, she was giving me goo goo eyes. So I, I messaged her, I was like, hey, Juana, do you wanna hang out this weekend? And she was like, sure. So I went to pick her up um, December 20th, and that, I had a, an iPhone and it always led me right. The map was always accurate, but for some reason that evening, it led me to some random apartment. It said, uh, destination arrived and it wasn't Juana's house and I could not find it. I was just out of my mind. I kept calling her, we couldn't even, I could not find it. It was in a part of town that I had never been to. So finally she's like, let's meet by the 7-Eleven. She met me at the 7-Eleven. I was super embarrassed. It was already like 8.30. I was just running an hour late because I couldn't find her house. So I took her downtown and we took the ferry from downtown San Diego to Coronado, which is a small peninsula separated by a bay. And we had a really great time. And on the way back, we kissed. And uh, that was kind of how it began. So uh, we had our first kiss and we had had our first date. And then on our second date, Juana asked me, are we going to be boyfriend and girlfriend? And I was not looking to have a girlfriend at the time. I had been through a breakup and I was just not having any of it. And I told her, no, I'm not really interested in that. And she started crying. And I thought, this girl is crazy. So I went home and I was making fun of her in front of everyone. I was telling my brother, oh my gosh, this girl's crazy. It was just a second date and she was already crying. And uh, my sister-in-law was like, uh, is she Latina? And I was like, yeah. She's like, we're just so emotional. Like, you can't make fun of her. We feel so heavy. We feel so strongly. And I was like, yeah, whatever. So the next day at Jack in the Box, she texted me and was like, Preston, I don't want to see you anymore. I know what you're doing. You're just using me for kisses and you don't want to be my boyfriend. And I was like, whatever. I don't want to talk to you ever again. And then a couple weeks later, I was like, 
oh man, I kind of miss Juana. She was pretty fun. So I texted her. I was like, hey, let's just hang out as friends. We went to Red Robin to have hamburgers at the mall. And I actually have a picture of that night. I took a picture of her and I just had so much darn fun. Juana was just the funniest girl I'd ever hung out with. So whenever I went on dates with girls, I was just kind of nervous and it was just, you know, but I just had so much fun. She was making me laugh like I had never laughed before. She was just hilarious. And I was like, I've never met a girl this funny and I feel so normal and calm around her. And that's kind of how it developed. And eventually we just, you know, started, I asked her to be my girlfriend uh, February 21st and then 364 days later on January 20th, um, we got married. And here's a picture of that. We got married in the San Diego temple. Um, and that was it. So that's my story about how I met my wife. And there's so much to that story. I wish I could tell you all, but I'd, we'd be here for three hours, but it's a really complex and deep story. And even though my, my, my mission was one of the spiritual highlights of my life, meeting my wife and everything that happened with her, was the most important thing I've ever done in my life. It is the absolute most important thing I've ever done, period. And uh, those who know my wife will tell you that she's a really special person. So that's how I met my wife, and I'll tell that story another time, uh, the rest of that story another time, but it's just something that I, I really value. Matt Hamlin asked, should you always put shoe trees in your shoes when you are not wearing them? Yes, there's no question about it. If you're not wearing your shoes, put cedar shoe trees inside of them and the shoe will last a long time. This is the one thing that can cause premature wear and prema premature death for your shoes. Always wear shoe trees when you're, put shoe trees in your shoes. Matt Gills 97 asked, what was the most recent lesson you've learned on a project? Wow, that's a really good question. The most recent lesson, I've learned how to use a, a brush a little bit better and patina with, with the patina. I'm still learning a lot. So I think it was probably dipping the brush in and then wiping it on a rag or something and using just the little bit that's left to kind of shade in better. Probably the last thing I learned. John Camp 17, ideal best suit. What kind of suit, color details, and by which tailoring house? If I could choose anyone to make me a suit, it'd probably be something on, you know, a tailor from Savile Row. They're just completely legendary and you just, I don't know, that's probably... Uh, the the dream of anyone who's looking for a best book suit. If I could just choose one suit, just one, it either would be dark gray or navy blue. Gosh, I like both so much. I really like a good gray suit, but I also really like a good navy suit. I'd probably have to go with navy. It's just really classic with a crisp white t-shirt and uh, a nice, you know, a nice burgundy tie and, and just hard to beat. It's just a really, you know, just a classic suit you can wear year round. So I'm really a fan of, of the Navy suit. Um, it's probably because that's the first suit I ever bought was a Navy suit. So I'm really into that. So something from Savile Row, I, I really don't know who, but any from anywhere, anywhere in Savile Row, I think I'd be happy. Huge Dupuy asked, uh, would you want to be a street shiner for a day? Yeah, absolutely. And that's something I, in Mexico that... That's kind of, and actually, I can't believe I didn't mention this. In Mexico, there were a lot of street shiners who I would get my shoes shined from because we were we wore a white shirt and tie every day. And these guys were really talented. I mean, they didn't do what I do, obviously, but they were just so hardworking and they were just so much fun to talk to and have a good time with. So yeah, I would like to do, and I'm probably gonna do a video about that one day. I'm gonna go down somewhere and shine people's shoes for free. Um, he also asked, Boots or shoes, and do you still donate shoes with the foundation? Okay, this is a hard one. Boots or shoes? Um, I love dress shoes, but I have always, since I was a little kid, I must have been 9 or 10, I've always been a fan of boots. In fact, when I was in second grade, there was a girl with a really nice pair of leather boots, and I wanted that pair. I just didn't care that they were for girls. I just thought they looked so cool, and I was pestering my mom to find them, but... I've always loved boots. I've just been a huge fan of boots. Um, here's one of my favorite boots right now. I don't know if you can see it. It's by TLB Mallorca. It's the Orson boot in Museum Calf, dark brown. Just look at that. Just hard to beat. So, always been a big, big, big fan of boots. Um, I always love suits with boots, especially if they're a Balmoral or a closed lacing boots. I think they just look really cool. 
Um, but that's just who I am. I mean, I know I talked to Kirby Allison about this. He told me he loves shoes. And he doesn't like doesn't like boots at all. But I really do like boots. So if I had to choose one, it would be boots. Do I still donate shoes? And and yes, I, I still donate shoes. Um, some shoes that are donated to me um, don't find a home for a while. So I have like 20 pairs right now that I'm still looking for a home for. Um, but yeah, I still donate shoes. It's not a huge endeavor, but I do it as best I can as often as I can. So I always appreciate when people donate brand new shoes. That's always the best. So they go straight to a new home and, and, and I do that. So that's always been fun to do. And I, I, I like finding people who are entering the workforce or, or whatever and need a good pair of shoes. It's always fun to do. John John Champ 17 shoe brand you wish you had more pieces from. Okay, so if you watched my review series, you'll know that I'm a, a humongous fan of TLB Mallorca. I think they're probably the best shoe for the price. So they're not the best shoe ever. Um, and But I really think that when it comes to the price and quality ratio, they hit the top. They're like perfectly priced and you get a lot of quality for, for what you're paying for. So more from TLB. Obviously right now I have... Uh, three pairs from them, four pairs, uh, and I also like Y by Yeosol. So um, I haven't done that video yet for the review series, but I'm blown away by Yeosol. They make fantastic, uh, really gorgeous shoes with fine details, hand welted, hand lasted, all that. But I am going to do a review on them. So here's my uh, shoe by Yeosol. They're just fantastic. I've shown these off before already, but I'm going to do a review for these because they're just so beautiful. So yeah, TLB Mallorca or Y by Yeosol. I want to see more of that. And of course, there are other brands that I don't own yet that I want to get into. Typical Mackie, if you could sit down and shine a pair with anyone alive or dead or famous, who and why? Whew, that is a hard one. They're just, I can't really think of anyone at the top of my head I'd like to shine shoes with. I'm going to regret this later because... I'm gonna think of the most amazing person later. If I could just sit down with anyone, it'd probably be Abraham Lincoln. Sit down and shine boots with him. I just, I've always been fascinated by by him. Maybe just talk to him about his ideas or just get, I mean, just meeting him would probably be pretty awesome. So uh, probably Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Pal Vinunez 0 asked, how many pairs of dress shoes do you have and can you show us your collection? I'd like to show you my collection in a future video for sure. How many pairs do I own? Like real personal pairs that I've purchased, not many, probably like 10 or 12. How many pairs do I own that have been sent to me by companies for reviews that I keep because they're my size? I have a good amount, probably 20 or 30 pairs that were given to me by, by brands for review for my opinion on them. But I, I mean, I don't know if I count them personally as personal shoes, but I really love what has been sent to me. Some of these shoes are just drop dead gorgeous. So, uh... Personal shoes that I've bought on my own time, 12, 13, but I do have a lot of pair of shoes, if I'm being honest. Theo Mitchell Ines asked, what is your favorite Sophia product? Whew. I'm actually sitting right next to my, all my Sophia. <sighs> my favorite Sophia product, Hermes Red. My absolute favorite. Okay, so this is the Medai Dior. Uh, cream polish in Hermes Red. Just my favorite. This product in general, it just has so much pigment, really conditions leather and shines fantastic. So I always tell people, just try one jar and you will be convinced, period. I'm that confident in Saphir. It's just fantastic. Go Through the Woods asked, when burnishing, should it look perfectly blended in before you add Renovatorin cream? Yes. Um, this is something that's kind of hard to do when you first start out, but your patina should look blended in. Okay, it should go from darker to light. And then you should mirror shine over that with a wax that is the color of the shoe, not the color of the burnish. So if it's a brown burnish on a tan shoe, don't use brown wax, use tan wax. And that really blends it in perfectly and camouflages all that together and it looks really jaw dropping in my opinion. Hicks in Transit asked, how many Holy Grail shoes do you have so far and how many do you plan on buying this year? So I recently purchased one of my Grail shoes. Um, you know, it's funny. I don't plan on buying shoes. I just end up finding shoes that I can't live without and I just buy them anyway. Um, I sell stuff if I have to. Like, not important stuff. Like, if I have some collectible that's worth some money that I don't want anymore, I'll sell it for a pair of shoes. Like, if there's a grail pair that I'm, like, into, 
I'll do whatever it takes to get to get it. For for example, here's a pair I've been looking for for a long time. It's the uh, Crockett and Jones Ralph Lauren, um, the Marlowe. So it's made in Shell Cordovan. I've just been looking for this pair for a super super long time. They're in size 8D. Uh, US. Unfortunately, they didn't fit me very well, so I might sell them if any of you are 8D and maybe you're looking for this shoe. Um, it's brand new. It's never been worn. Um, so just one of my grail shoes. I've been looking for this pair a long time. So when I saw them, I hopped on them quick. Okay, L. Norman Jr. asked, how long have you been refurb refurbished? Ugh. <laughs> how long have you been refurbishing shoes for? I've been doing what I do since 2017. Before that, I had never done a mirror shine in my life so since 2017 so not a long time but I've learned on the job and I'm a quick learner and I'm tenacious and I'm completely dedicated my wife knows this about me I can like if I'm dedicated or if I'm into something I will just go hardcore and I won't stop until I learn it or whatever so just since 2017 Sean Patrick Avila asked, for European brands like Carmina, what is the best way to figure out your size? I'm an eight triple E. So a lot of brands don't make wide widths from Europe. Carmina is one of those that does. Uh, TLB Mallorca, uh, if you do a made to order, they do a, 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 an H width, which is extra, extra wide. Um, honestly, you might have a hard time finding a very wide width uh, for brands like Carmina. My best, my advice would be to contact Carmina and try to figure that out. So have your shoe, or maybe you can measure your foot and see if they can find you a size, okay? Uh, it's, I wish I could help you more, but it, every person's different, you know, every shoe. Even people with the same size shoe, like, I'm an A triple E as well, but I don't know if your shoes, my shoes would fit you, so. Okay, well, it's actually uh, pretty late. It's midnight, so I'm going to continue this tomorrow, and then we can get to the rest of the questions. So I will see you tomorrow. All right, it's the next morning, so let's continue with the questions. Doran Boric asked, what do you think is the best way to pass shoe care onto my son as a hobby or as a routine? Um, that's a great question. I think that uh, probably be best to make it a routine, something you do often and together, and that'll probably instill within your son a desire to keep doing it. Of course, if they don't want to, it's totally okay. Just uh, maybe as a routine and then the hobby will develop later on like it did for me. XOXOXO Skater Boy XOXO asked, if you could only wear one pair of shoes for the rest of your life, what would it be? Wow, that's a hard one. One pair of shoes for the rest of my life. <sighs> Probably Alan Edmund Strands. I just like that pair of shoes way too much. Um, I know it's not, you know, the best for every occasion, but I wear jeans a lot, so I think the strand strands go great with, with dark wash jeans. So probably strands, and I could even, you know, wear them with certain suits and all that. So probably walnut strands. Probably not the answer you were looking for, though, huh? Heights Leather Company. What encouraged you, and how did you start the Elegant Oxford? Okay, so I don't remember where I got the name, the Elegant Oxford. I remember I started posting some of my videos on YouTube and I just needed a name. So I was in the car driving on the 5 North with my wife and I was looking for names. I had the beautiful Brogue, uh, the Dapper Derby, I had a bunch of names. And I think my wife was like, how about the Elegant Oxford? And I thought, that's a pretty cool name. And I think that's how I really decided. I, I don't remember a lot about that though. I really wish I did. I didn't think it would become anything. So it was not something I remember. It was just an unimportant detail. George P. Stonier asked, I'm always perplexed by white stitching and how to keep them white during polishing. Okay, so, right, if your shoe has white stitching, you don't want to cover that with brown or black or something else, because once that stitching gets covered, it's really impossible to get it white again, since it's on the shoe and you really can't bleach it or wash it without damaging the leather. So I always encourage everyone to use neutral colored creams and waxes for those types of shoes and you can keep that that uh, white stitching looking perfect and you won't have any problems in the future. If you've already done it, uh, I really don't know how to help. I've been looking for this solution for a while, but I really don't know. I think maybe a mild soap and water and a toothbrush might work. Chris the Batman asked, would you consider a hot dog a sandwich? Um, I don't know. It seems to fall into to yes and no, but I really like hot dogs, so 
it really doesn't matter as long as I enjoy the hot dog, I think I'll be happy. Sawyer Shenawark ask, do woodlore shoe trees work as well as higher quality shoe trees in terms of reshaping shoes? Uh, the answer is most definitely no. So Woodlore makes fantastic cedar shoe trees, but they're very basic in shape. They're not dynamic and lasted like some of these old uh, varnish shoe trees. So this is a lasted varnish tree, and I use them for restorations because they really fill in the shoe really well, and it kind of pushes everything out perfectly. And it, they're really well shaped. So they're hard to find. I, I get them at vintage shops if I can. But if you go online, they can get quite expensive. They can get into the $100 range. So. Keep that in mind, and if you like doing a lot of restorations, maybe consider investing in a pair of lasted varnish trees like that. The Daniel Harper asked, what color dress shoe is your favorite? Okay, um, that would definitely be Oxblood and Burgundy. They're my two, the Red Spectrum, is my, they're my favorite to wear. They really go with everything except for black, so they go with brown, green, tan, blue everything you could think of and they're just really versatile so i really like the way they look and i think yeah definitely have to be oxblood that's my favorite ornelas mariano asked where can you go to buy saphir products in mexico great question so i don't i've asked around actually and i don't know of one retailer in mexico that sells saphir but if you really want it, I would probably advise you to contact maybe a family member or a friend in the United States who could buy it and then ship it to you. I know there are forwarding services and different types of services that will send stuff. So you buy Saphir from the US, it's sent to this forwarding company and the forwarding company sends it to, to Mexico where you are. So I know there are a bunch of companies that do that. Uh, some of my clients in the United Arab Emirates do that. So consider doing that. Unfortunately, I don't actually know of anyone who sells Saphir in Mexico. Ludus2 asked, Oxford or Derby's? Um, definitely Oxford's. And it's not because it's called the Elegant Oxford. I just really love closed lacing shoes. They've always been my favorite. They look regal and sharp and just beautiful. So if I want to go more casual, I usually just get, um, you know, uh, <laughs> a quarter brogue or you know, an Oxford with a lot of broguing on it, just to bring down it and make it more casual and add a, add a lighter color. So strands are probably something like what I'm referring to. Uh, an Oxford that's tan in color to make it really casual, and then has a lot of broguing. JS asked, how will I convince my partner that owning more shoes than her is justifiable? And more importantly, how do I get her on board? Okay, so this is a running joke. If you're a member of any of our shoe groups on Facebook, like Alan Edmonds Enthusiast, all the guys are always joking about hiding packages. So they'll order something and have it sent to their work because their wives get upset that they're spending so much money. So, I mean, it's a joke, but there's some truth in it. If your partner has a an issue with you buying shoes because it's just your hobby, um, I mean, just it's, it's good to evaluate why your partner might be upset. If it's because you're actually spending more money than you make, if you're living outside of your means, your partner probably has a point. So don't go spending more money than you have. Don't go into debt to buy shoes. It's not a good idea. Like I, There are people who will buy something they like and not even have enough money to pay rent. So that's not what I'm talking about. If your partner um, has a problem with your healthy hobbies, you should probably have a discussion and talk about what things make you happy and why buying shoes is something that you like to do and go from there. So that I know this can actually get into some serious marital relationship problems, but it's always good to talk to your partner. And if you're not married and don't have a girlfriend, make sure that when you're dating and courting, you, you discuss that and you look for a partner who is um, the type of person that would allow you to do stuff like that. So for example, when I was dating my wife, uh, I really love video games and I really, really love stuff like that. I mean, my daughter's name is Zelda for goodness sakes. And I just needed to find someone who would accept me for who I am. I love to buy stuff. I like to buy shoes and collectibles and movies. I'm just one of those type of guys. And I needed to find someone who accepted that and liked me for who I am. So long answer to a, a question, but I know that's probably something that can make you happy or not, not happy. Aristotle Marangu asked, how scared should I be wearing Goodyear welted or Blake stitch shoes while it's raining or snowing? <clears throat> if a shoe is Goodyear welted, you will be fine. Um, as someone who dunks Goodyear welted shoes in water on occasion, I can tell you that Goodyear welted shoes are very, very waterproof. I mean, 
You could stick water inside of a Goodyear welted shoe and it'll hold it like a cup and nothing will come out. And conversely, you could have water pretty high up on the shoe and it won't get in. So the, the welt really seals that shoe in for a pretty good darn long time. Blake stick shoes are, or they're called McKay Blake stitch shoes. They're less waterproof. So if you step in a, in, in, in a, in a puddle, you're definitely gonna get water up there. So I don't recommend Blake stitch shoes for, you know, rain or for snow or stuff like that. Okay. I'm just not a fan of Blake stitch shoes generally. And I have nothing against them personally. I just prefer traditional Goodyear welt. Tim Tran asked, how would you rank shoe brands based on fast food chains? For example, Allen Edmonds is McDonald's. Um, I don't know if I'd consider Allen Edmonds McDonald's. I think I'd consider off the rack shoes like what you'd find at Marshall's or Ross. Those are probably like McDonald's, really cheap. And they're just around everywhere and you can find them. Allen Edmonds isn't super, super high class. It's an entry level line. So I'd probably, probably not a good comparison. I'd probably compare them to Chili's or Applebee's. You know, not super high class, but better than McDonald's overall. But there are some shoes that are just, you know, five-star Michelin star restaurants. Uh, there's actually a restaurant in San Diego called Mr. A's. It's beautiful. It overlooks all of San Diego, the, the downtown skyline. It's just really beautiful. I went there for my third year anniversary with my wife. I'd consider that you know, I'd consider one of these higher end brands like or John Lobb or one of these amazing brands probably as a Mr. A's if I had to choose. Axie asked, which shoe brands would you recommend that are good quality and not breaking the bank? So this is related to the question I had before. Um, if you have, are on a budget and you don't want to spend a lot of money and you have around 250 to $200, there are some good brands that you can find. There's actually a video uh, by Vladimir Riche on YouTube. It's like the top 10 brands under $300. And he talks about some really great brands. If you want to check that video out, you should. You'll, it'll point you in the right direction. But just, you know, going over it, basically, I'd say that Mir Min is, is a brand you could look into for $200. Uh, also, Allen Edmonds, they go on sale and they're on sale most throughout the year. And you can get a good pair of Allen Edmonds for $250 to $300, sometimes even $200. And uh, as far as that goes, I think Allen Edmonds are definitely worth $200. I think they're a fantastic shoe for that price, and you can get some really good styles for the money. So check out that video by Vladimir Riche if you're looking for a lot of great shoes for the price. Um, another great company is Carlos Santos. I know they're not as popular, but they are. They make a really, really great shoe, better than Mere Men in my opinion. They're a little bit more expensive. You'd get them into the $300, $320 range, but they also make some fantastic shoes. You can find them on sale for $270 sometimes, and I'm really impressed by Carlos Santos. So check out Costas at the Noble Shoe if you want to look at that. Honda954 asked, have you ever used Saphir cream on your hands when they get dry due to acetone alcohol use when performing work? No, I, I usually don't. In fact, I wear gloves most of the time when I'm working because I work in a lot of pairs of shoes. I'm touching dye and cream and wax all the time. And then if my wife needs me or I have to run up and grab my daughter or whatever, I don't want to have to be washing my hands all day. I just take the gloves off. They're black nitrile gloves and they just go in the trash and that's it. And it's been a lot easier on my hands and, and all that. So. No problem there, but I, I, I don't put Saphir on my hands at all. Don the General asked, if you had to wear one style or one brand of shoe forever, which would it be? Wow, versatile for suits, business casual, etc. That's a great question. If I could only wear, I'm not gonna go with one style, maybe one brand. If I could only wear one brand for the rest of my life, probably be high end. I mean, I'm gonna be honest here. Um, I've always really been interested in Enzo Bonafé. I hear a lot of great things about Enzo Bonafé and uh, Antonio Macariello are two brands that I'm really, really interested in looking at. Probably something high-end. I, I really don't know. But uh, in terms of one shoe that's really versatile, probably something in Oxblood or Burgundy. Okay, probably an Oxford in Oxblood. That way you could wear it with a suit very comfortably and you could go down with jeans or chinos very, very comfortably as well. So overall, probably an Oxblood uh, Oxford. JJ721. <laughs> Favorite question, does Preston get free stuff? And say, Preston, have you been working out lately? So yes, um, 
I actually do get free stuff from some companies. I know some people have been asking me if I if I get free stuff. I do get free stuff. Um, some companies send me free shoes for a, a review, but I don't promise them anything. I don't promise them a, figure, a, a, a positive review. I tell them that I'm going to accept the shoe and that it's going to be an honest review. Okay, and that's all I can promise them. So if I have a review on a pair of shoes, those are my honest thoughts. Um, if they really, really, really suck, I won't even review them. I won't even do the review. I just don't want to bring that type of content to you. So I usually only review pairs of shoes that I think are worth it, and then I go from there. But I'm usually really positive in my reviews. There's really never been a, a huge glaring issue on any of the shoes I've reviewed so far. They've all been great. But I, I will let you know that TLB Mallorca so far has been the best shoe I've reviewed bar none and then there's other really fantastic brands that are equal or maybe a little less like Carmina, J Fitzpatrick and then there are brands that I've already gotten that are superior to TLB but they're more expensive like Y by ESL. So yeah I do get free stuff I, I mean at this point I don't know if I would be willing to pay all the money that I that I would need to spend to get those shoes and this way I work with brands to be able to to review shoes and then I get to have some content. So that's just the honest truth. The Elegant Oxford, um, I didn't do it before, but I just decided one day to contact a company. I was like, hey, I'm the Elegant Oxford and I've always loved a pair of your shoes and would you want to do a review? Would you let me do a review on one of your pairs? And I expected them to take the shoes back when I was done, but they were like, you can keep the shoes, no problem. And that's kind of how it started. So uh, I just want to be as transparent, as clear as I can be. Um, I hope no one thinks I'm, I'm malicious. I know some people have accused me of of lying and saying that uh, people are paying me for good reviews. That's just not the case. I would never lie to my, my audience. If there's a pair of shoes that I don't like, I will definitely let you know and I won't even review them. So that's just the truth. Uh, say, Preston, have you been working out lately? Yeah, I actually, I have been working out lately. Um, about four months ago, it was my 30th, actually no, it was my 31st birthday on August 30th. Uh, my doctor told me my cholesterol was just a little bit too high. I was a lot heavier, and I decided to start working out. And um, so I was in pretty good shape before I got married. I was pretty skinny, and then I got married. And then in those the last four years, I I ballooned and gained a lot of weight, probably 50 pounds of nasty overweight fat. I would just my wife and I were just really happy. We'd eat out at McDonald's and. Taco Bell almost every day. I think all three of our meals every day were Taco Bell and fast food. So I gained some pretty bad weight. Um, and then I was at, so I was 150 pounds when I got married and I jumped up to 195. So I was pretty darn heavy. I'm only 5'5", five five, so I shouldn't be that big for my height. And my brother has been working out for many, many years. And he finally told me, hey, why don't you come over Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we can work out together. And my brother's been training me. So I'm doing a lot of deadlifting, squatting, bench pressing, and then other type of auxiliary work with him. My brother's a great trainer. I really uh, respect him, and I really want to thank him for helping me to lose weight. And I've started running recently. So I run, you know, five days a week. And the other day, for the first time in my life, I was able to run five miles without stopping, which is amazing because I've never been able to even run a mile before. So when I started in August, I couldn't even walk around my block, which is a mile circle i couldn't finish the mile without my legs hurting so bad and i just decided to keep pushing it and i would wake up at 6 30 and just go running and i hated every minute of it i remember just not being able to sleep at night because my legs would hurt so bad and i just didn't know what to do but I, in my mind i was determined just to for the first time in my life to take control and start running and uh yeah i mean i'm not a fast runner at all i'm not in great shape either i'm just making slow progress and I found that the slower you lose weight, the more likely you are to keep it off because you're making lifestyle changes that are permanent instead of doing crash diets where you lose 30 pounds. I've just been slowly improving my diet, working out every day, and uh, lifting really, really heavy weight, which is something I never really have done before. My brother was like, trust me, if you start squatting, deadlifting, and bench pressing with me, you're going to feel stronger and more energetic than you ever have. And I feel fantastic. I mean, I'm the strongest I've ever been in my life. I'm not super strong by any stretch of the imagination at all um, but I, I compared to where I was a year ago I am way way stronger and way way faster and in better shape so uh, I always recommend to oh actually and my my shoe size decreased I was an eight triple E 
Now I'm an 8E, so it reduced two widths, which is great, and my clothes fit better, and, and I think I feel and look better overall. So, yeah, I have been working out. Okay. Um, I actually did not write who wrote this question, so I'm sorry. It, it just wasn't in my notes. The question is, in all seriousness, I am curious about what advice you can offer young adults regarding finding a career that provides them with fulfillment. Seeing as you have interacted with students in need of dress shoes for job interviews, I was hoping to get some insight into their into your position, or how you've or your thoughts um, from your experience alone. Excuse me for making the the assumption that you can answer this, but I I reason that you can considering your education you received and your family and the community you've created. You've created. Thank you for the videos. I hope the other questions are more creative than mine. This is actually one of the most creative questions I've gotten, so thank you very much. Um, I always recommend to young adults or people in high school, um, or I'd go earlier when you, you hit puberty and you're going, you know, you, you become a teenager, you're 12. I start to really tell people that that age that they should start to consider the impact that their choices will make in their future. So it may not, you may not notice it or you may not even think it's possible. But when you're 12, the choices you start to make at that age will determine where you're going to end up when you're 30. And that can be kind of daunting for a 12 year old or a 13 year old or a 14 year old. But especially when you're 16, 17, you really need to start realizing that you need to be responsible and accountable for the choices you make. So I always tell people prepare early, do the best you can, study hard. And I know studying sucks because I hate studying and I've, I've never liked school, even though, you know, I'm okay at it. But I always caution uh, young, uh, you know, young people, young adults to uh, prepare early. And in terms of finding a career that will fulfill you, that's a complicated question. But I think as long as you work hard and you prepare early, you'll have a lot more opportunity to find a career that you like. If you make, but if you make choices early on that are very detrimental to you, that might close a lot of doors on you. For example, and, and I don't want to feel, I don't want anyone here to feel that I'm judging you if you've made similar choices. I don't mean to belittle you or anything like that. I just want you to know that these are just examples. If you're a teenager and you get pregnant or you get a girl pregnant, that could possibly close a lot of doors on you and make life uh, a lot harder than it has to be. So speaking from friends have had, I've had that happen to, they've told me, yeah, life was just really difficult. I've had friends go to jail. I've had friends who, you know, drove drunk and, and had an accident and now they're paying the consequence for it years later. So if anything, always prepare early, uh, make the best choices you can, learn to be uncomfortable, learn to make choices that are hard, but that are good for you. Like I, I have known this my whole life, but I've recently been applying that with running. Running is very uncomfortable. It's very painful. And the whole time you're running, I thought at some point I'd feel good doing it. The whole time your brain's like, stop, 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 stop punishing me. Stop striking the pavement again and again. But you have to just embrace the fact that it's just what has to happen because you're trying to reach your goals. And uh, I mean, in reality, you're you're choosing to do something painful and, well, not painful, but you're doing something that's difficult and hard for the greater good. And that, that's really all I can say. I wish there was more time to give you a more comprehensive answer, but uh to review it's make good choices be responsible and be accountable and delay gratification so that you can have graduation or that you can reach your goals whatever that may be and that takes a million different forms whether it's making sure that you go to class instead of hanging out with friends or making sure that you decide to make this choice instead of that choice. Even though the other choice feels better or is more appealing, if it's not the right choice, make sure to choose the uncomfortable, hard, but correct choice. Hopefully that's a good enough answer for you. And this is probably, uh, it's really a creative question. Jonathan Robinson asked, how has your journey evolved since you began your channel and where do you wanna go in 2021? The channel has evolved. Um, it, it really went from just, you know, wanting, to just put my videos online for fun to content creation to actually you know doing reviews and all that stuff so starting my review series was something that i've really enjoyed i actually love talking about new shoes and new products and and all that stuff so i, I hope to continue the review series and 
uh, be able to look at new shoes that you that I recommend you guys check out. There are a couple of brands I'm looking into right now, but overall it's been fun to grow in knowledge about shoes and grow in, in my appreciation for the fine details. So where do I see myself in 2021? Um, you know, with the Elegant Oxford, I really don't know. I just hope that it keeps progressing and growing. And in my personal life, I just hope to continue getting in better shape, continue to spend time with my family and, and, and then welcoming our son in May so that we can have, you know, that adventure. Because the first year with our daughter was amazing. That first year with our, our little baby, our daughter, Zelda, is the best year of my life. So I'm excited to start another one. So don't be afraid to have kids. I'm telling you, the movies make it seem 20,000 times worse than it actually is. kind of disappointing when I watch movies. Every movie or everything online makes it seem that children are just terrible, but they're not. They're the most amazing thing ever, and I absolutely love it. And being a parent is, is fun. I mean, it's like starting a new job. Of course, there are hardships. Of course, there are new things to get used to, but it's fun. It's so amazing and fulfilling, and I love it. So looking forward to that. Rail SO asked, I have a question about the influences in your life. Presumably your gentlemanly values can be attributed to your father and also Bruce Wayne, but surely not all of your friends ex exude the same appreciation for quality shoes as you do. So what values do you find that you share with your friends? In other words, what other hobbies do you enjoy that your friends enjoy as well? Uh, great question. So um, I can attribute a lot of what I do to my dad because he likes shoes the same as I do, and he taught me how to wear a suit and how to tie a tie. But I think the unsung hero of this tale is my mom. She's a very professional, uh, intelligent woman who I respect very highly. Uh, I kind of joke around that she's the Terminator because I, I can't even remember a time I've seen her sleep or eat. She's just the most hardworking, professional, um, unrelenting person I've ever met. She is a force of nature. And anyone who knows her will tell you that she's up at four in the morning and she doesn't go to bed till one o'clock sometimes. And she just is super hardcore. I mean, I just, I don't know. My mom always instilled within me these values of not being mediocre, of striving to do my best. And she's always cared about looking professional. And she always told me, son, you never arrive anywhere looking like you haven't showered. It's just not right. So I, I have to say it's my mom. My mom really is that secret person behind me that no one ever sees or praises like they praise my dad, but she is definitely the driving force behind who I am and a lot of the success I've had. So I love my mom. I know I don't say that enough and a lot of people don't really, you know, after the divorce, I don't think people saw her as often, but uh, she's definitely that secret unsung hero that everyone should know about. So I want to publicly thank her. And uh, yeah, I look just like her, by the way. I don't look like my dad. I look a lot like my mom. I think the same way she thinks in a lot of ways. So what other hobbies do I enjoy? So yeah, I actually don't have friends who enjoy what I enjoy when it comes to shoes and all that. Uh, my brother does. He really does like shoes. But my other best friend, I have, I have four or five best friends that I've known for 20 years. They don't like shoes, but that to me, that's not why they're my best friends. We're best friends because we like video games and movies and uh, we love to, to hang out and eat food. That's the thing we do. We'll go out get good food and we'll talk for hours. We'll stay out to one in the morning just talking and laughing about the experiences we've had together. That's always been something that I value. So good food, good friends. And then um, we like to talk about cars. When we were younger, we were really into cars. Um, I had it, My first car was a 1988 Mazda RX-7 that I bought in high school. And we used to like Japanese, little Japanese cars. And then as we've grown up, we've gotten to different things. We like to go to the range to go shooting guns. We We've always been really into shooting guns. That's something we like to do. But mostly we just like to hang out and spend time together because we're like family. So we, we, we have our lives in common. We don't The likes that we have aren't really what keeps us in common. It's just who we are, our mindsets, and the way we, we view the world. So yeah, I spend a lot of time with my friends. Um, they're the family that I've chosen to have, and uh, I love them to death. Everyone who knows me knows that my family is, you know, my parents and my brother, but my friends. I have a group of friends who I would do anything for. I love them. I've laughed and cried with them. I've just been through so much with them, and I, I hope to continue that brotherhood for the rest of my life. So if they're watching this, I, they, they know that, and we've always spent time together. Okay, Alex D asked, can you tell us more about your father? How big of an influence was he getting you into shoe shining? So my dad uh, grew up pretty poor in Tijuana, Mexico. He was born there. 
and he told me a story that always stuck with me. So my grandma would always buy him shoes at the beginning of the new year, and one year he didn't like the shoes my grandma bought, so he purposefully uh, made a hole in the sole, thinking that my grandma would buy him another pair if he did that. Uh, and he went home and said, look, mom, the shoes are, are all old and there's a hole there. So my grandma got really mad and scolded him and made him put newspaper in the shoes. And he had to wear them the rest of the year like that damaged because she knew he had done that on purpose. And he said, ever since then, I decided to take care of my shoes. And that's just been how he's been, you know, his entire life. And then he said in the 70s, he got his first job. And with the first $100 he ever made, he bought a pair of Floresham Imperials which he had up until about 2016, and then one day he just gave them away. So I, w I came to him a couple years ago, I was like, Dad, do you still have those Floresham Imperials I used to see when you know we were growing up? And he's like, oh, son, I, I gave those away. So he's a really humble, nice guy, he just doesn't think twice to give away a pair of shoes, even if he bought them 30 years before and they were his first pair of shoes. So that's my dad, always been the kind, nice guy. Like, he has a car, but he'll just take the bus sometimes because he wants to talk to people. He's just one of those, type of guys, I guess. He just likes to be friends with everybody, which is embarrassing, which was embarrassing when I was a little kid. I was like, Dad, don't talk to people. But now I see why he does it. It's pretty fun. Ethan W. asked, I'm going to McDonald's. Do you want anything? <laughs> uh, I actually do go to McDonald's. I think a lot of people make fun of McDonald's. They're like, uh, it's McDonald's, but it's delicious. Like, I don't go to McDonald's often, but I'm not going to lie. I, I love McDonald's. I've I always go there, and whatever I have always tastes really good. It's not good for you, but can't go wrong with McDonald's. I'm not going to lie. Jake Warren asks, what are your favorite British cobblers or shoemakers? So I don't know any cobblers in the UK, um, but British shoemakers are pretty legendary. You know, I think the, well, not the most popular, but I think one that's really well known is Crockett and Jones. I've already talked about, about him in this video. They just make stunning shell cordovan designs and shoes. Always been my favorite. The Sky 2 is a boot by Crockett and Jones that I've been looking for for a very long time. It's one of my grail pairs. So I've always been a fan of Crockett and Jones. I know there are better companies than Crockett and Jones like Gaziano and Girling, John Lobb, all those guys who are just world famous for, for their shoes. But yeah, the UK is legendary. MH Armand Sheik asked, does the quality of the leather matter while achieving a mirror shine? I believe it does. I just haven't actually broken it down and figured out what it is. I have pairs that have shined crazy fast, like the Gaziano and Girling St. James 2. I've worked on two pairs, and both times they shined amazingly, amazingly. Like, they looked perfect when they were shined. And then the pair that I've shined that looked the best that I've ever done, my best mirror shine of all time was on a pair of Mir Min Linea Maestro cap toes in black. And I don't know what leather, if it was the leather or my technique, but I do believe leather does make a difference. I just don't really know the exact science behind it. Texas gentleman asked, do you have any particular icons in menswear that inspire you? I think the first time I actually saw a suit on someone, I thought that looks really great was James Bond. I'm gonna be honest, um, my dad, is a big fan of Sean Connery, the original James Bond. I always remember he had this gray, light gray suit. I thought it looked really sharp, but it wasn't until Daniel Craig in, in uh, Casino Royale, there's a scene where he's uh, on the train with Vesper and he's wearing this navy blue suit with this uh, burgundy tie and he just looked fantastic. And I think it's probably one of the first times I ever really was like, whoa, that looks really cool. So uh, James Bond, is he's a hard style icon to be. Another would probably be my brother. He's a really good dresser. Um, Everyone who knows him has always been like, wow, I don't know how he pulls off the stuff he pulls off, but he's just real. You know, sprezzatura, the movement where you you purposely try to look like you didn't try too hard, um, that you're stylish by nature and not by choice. My brother, he doesn't try on purpose to look like he's not trying. Like he literally just puts whatever he has on and it looks really great. And a lot of people have complimented him in front of me and a lot of people have told me, man, your brother is a sharp dresser. So that's just always been who he is. I really believe that by nature, he's he's just really fashionable and, and he has good style. So my brother would probably be the closest person I know who is a style icon that I always looked up to. 
Logan McDonald asked, have you always shaved your head? If so, why? If not, do you have a picture of your hair at its longest? No, I've not always shaved my head, but I did lose my hair early on. I was uh, 19, 20 on my mission, and I started to lose a lot of hair, so I, I got a, a, a buzzer and just buzzed my head to a one. And ever since then, I, I let it go. I think you'd be shocked. I mean, I don't think you'd be shocked, but it's pretty obvious that we as people get place a lot of emphasis on our hair. Which is why I get a lot of when people want to insult me online. That's what they try to make fun of me is that I'm bald, because people really they're, t they're telling me a lot about themselves by that that attempt to insult me. So they really care about their hair. But you'd be surprised how freeing it is when you shave your head for the first time and you realize how unimportant hair is and how little it matters. It just really strengthened me as a person to not care about these these things that really make no difference in our lives, having hair or not having hair. I mean, it doesn't matter. And uh, I love being bald. It's one of my favorite things. It, it really is just part of who I am. And I don't mind it at all. So yeah, I did lose my hair early in life. Uh, my brother did too, he's bald too, but my dad has a great thick head of hair for his age. It's curly. So we got it from my mom's side for sure, but I don't mind it. You know, I'm a short bald man. I'm 5'5 five, five and I'm bald, but it's never held me back at all. I really think that it, it just hasn't been uh, 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 detrimental to anything in my life so I really like it oh and you want to see a picture of me with hair well I'll put one up right now okay so that's a picture of me with hair right there Niels R could a cobbler recreate a beveled waist if not will the bevel be lost when resoling no actually and I should probably this right here this is a fiddle back waist you see that and some have a, a beveled waist, which means it's just rounded off more. So if you get your a shoe like this resold, a competent cobbler uh, can definitely make the bevel again and reshape the fiddle back if needed. Okay, but it have to be a it would have to be a pretty competent cobbler because this is definitely a, a detail in very fine shoemaking. So I don't expect the average cobbler to be able to do that. So look for a very good cobbler. If, if you're in the United States, I know Steve at Beatles Leatherworks definitely knows how to do it. I've seen him do it in videos and, you know, if you ever want to do Or you can, if you have a pair of Gaziano and Girling, you can contact them and they can resole it for you or, or something similar like that. So yeah, it's definitely possible to have the fiddle back or a beveled waist if you get a resole. There's no need to fear about that. Just find a good, competent cobbler. Isado Bushman asked, what classic style of shoe would you like to see a modern take on? Uh, as always, I've said that I love spade soles. Spade soles are my absolute favorite, and I love to see them on modern shoes. Uh, it's, it's not a design, that you, a design element you see very often anymore. I don't know if you can see it right here. Here's the spade. It's, it's that sharp cut in. looks like a shovel. And then on the other side, you can see it as well. Right there. I like seeing that that style. I actually have a video. I actually have a video about why I like it so much. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. I go way into why I like it. And uh, yeah, definitely like to see some spade soles in, in, in the modern era. Neo Arch asked, which shoe brand do you recommend for extra wide feet apart from Allen Edmonds or Alden without going custom or made to order? That's a hard one. I know Rancourt, they make uh, double E and triple E shoes and there are various other American heritage brands but they really don't go into dress shoes as much as boots and all that but Rancourt makes some shell cordovan shoes in the USA and they have double E triple E aside from that there are not many others and if you're not willing to go made to order at least it's probably going to be a little bit difficult I know that TLB Mallorca if you go uh, if you do a custom shoe um, which is just I think it's like less than $100 extra and you can select your last and your width and all that. So definitely possible. It's just gonna be a little bit harder. So Allen Edmonds and Alden are gonna be your go-to. Danny R, what's your favorite dress boot? So my favorite dress boot is definitely that Oxford closed lacing Balmoral boot. It looks really elegant, looks really, really rugged at the same time. So it's really a cool bad boy look, I think, when you wear Balmoral boots with a suit just looks really cool. So a lot of companies make great ones like I've already showed you. TLB Mallorca makes the Orson, which is one of my favorites. Carmina also makes an excellent boot. 
um, and there are other uh, Gordon Jim June. I've been looking at their Instagram, and and they make a Balmoral boot that I've really really wanted. So I'm going to contact them in the future about having one made because it just looks really cool in my opinion. I just love it. Jet Slugs asked. What are your other favorite pieces of footwear in your collection that aren't the usual suspects? Oh, that's a good question too. So I really like classic white sneakers. I have the Nike Killshot 2, which is one I wear all the time. I just really like the way it looks. Um, there's always Stan Smith's, the classic white sneaker. Um, but other than that, I mean, I don't wear sneakers all the time. If I'm not in, in like dress shoes or dress boots, I'm usually in my Nikes that I go running in. So I get up in the morning, put on my socks and my Nikes and I'm usually in that all day. You can't go wrong with a classic sneaker, and I really like the Nike Kill Shot too. It's just a little bit more modern, and I just like the way it looks, you know, with the gum bottom and everything. So, uh, yeah, definitely the Nike Kill Shot too. Kevin77 Parker said, My son is 15 and has taken a very serious interest in shoes, especially dress shoes. What brand or what else, what other style would you recommend for someone just starting a shoe collection? We enjoy watching our videos. Thank you so much. I hope you and your son uh, uh, continue to watch the, the, the channel. So at 15, you're probably, your foot's big enough where you can buy a nice pair of dress shoes. So I would recommend when your son has his next birthday to take him to Allen Edmonds and have him size and then maybe buy him a pair of, of Allen Edmonds. Which pair you should buy first is up to debate. If you wear suits all the time, the Black Park Avenue is classic, but I'm going to be honest, I don't wear a suit that often anymore, so I would probably go with walnut strands or oxblood strands or or one of the classic five styles that Allen Edmonds makes, which is the McAllister, the Strand, maybe even a boot. I know they have some pretty popular styles like the Higgins Mill, but um, you can't go wrong with the good old Strand. Um, but if your son, you know, maybe your budget's a little tighter, you can always go and buy shoes online that are gently used and then, you know, shine them yourself. I have a couple videos on, on, on doing that. But this is an important part of, of, of a person's style journey. So make sure you go with them and enjoy that moment as a father and a son. And uh, yeah, that's, that's really awesome. Thank you for that question. Will Oglisby asked, how do I get in contact with you to discuss what would what I would want done on a pair of shoes that I might send to you. So like I've already mentioned, you can email me at theelegantoxford at gmail.com. That's usually the best place to contact me. Um, I apologize. I know a lot of people contact me through Instagram and Facebook Messenger trying to get a hold of me. I'm going to be honest. I don't check Instagram Messenger very often. I just That's the place where I get the most solicitations to try to talk to me. So I have thousands and thousands of unread messages that I just can't get to. So Instagram is not the best place to get to me. Um, but if you join my Facebook group, hashtag Shine Your Shoes or the Allen Edmonds Enthusiasts, you can definitely try to tag me there on a post. And I usually answer, so I'm pretty active on Facebook. Or you can try emailing me, but as I've already mentioned, pester me until I respond because I'm just so busy and I can't answer everybody. Juan Rivera asked, from Compton, California. Great. Awesome. You're close by. Do you plan to actively teach your children or will you wait to see if they naturally are drawn to the trade that you've learned from your dad? Um... I'll probably teach them to shine their shoes. I'm gonna teach them some stuff that'll probably uh, maybe kind of coax them in the right direction. But if they don't like shoes when they grow up, that's totally fine. My dad's a huge soccer fan and I can't stand soccer at all. And that kind of hurt him when he was younger. Oh, my sons don't like soccer, but hey, my kids don't have to like what I like. So I think that's definitely okay, but I'll, I'll definitely introduce it to them and I, hopefully they, they like it. But if they don't like it, no problem. I think that's fine. Cesar Aparicio asked, what are the most challenging aspects of the job? Definitely the most challenging aspect of being a YouTube content creator is the people that comment sometimes. Some people can be so rude and so negative and so hurtful. They just say really hurtful things. Uh, on Facebook and in groups, some people can just be negative. Some people can be really spiteful, hateful, vindictive, petty. I mean, I just... It just happens. So you deal with a lot of negative people. So if you want to be on YouTube, just make sure you have thick skin. I mean, some things won't get to you, but some comments will. Some of them will just straight up hurt your feelings and it just sucks. So I've gotten some pretty negative comments about everything that you could imagine. Some people are just crazy and they're there on YouTube to be trolls because, I don't know, they have nothing better to do than to be on YouTube. So that's just the reality of it. That's probably the, the hardest part of the job. The other one is just finding time to do everything. I think everyone wants a piece of me. Everyone wants to have me work on their shoes or make a video about something. I just don't have time to, sp to, to spread myself so thin and do absolutely everything that everybody wants and that hurts people's feelings sometimes. I had people 
And if you're watching this video, do not do this. Do not, if I haven't read an email or something, do not comment on my Instagram picture and say, why haven't you answered my email? It's just don't do that. It's just really annoying and I just can't get back to everybody. I, I really wish I could. But the people definitely make this job hard. And the people also make it amazing. I mean, there are people that I've met who support me and help me and they're just been the absolute best. But uh, the people for sure are, are the worst part and they can be the worst part. Seiko Genesean asked, is there a way to dye Shell Cordovan? Obviously, I think, well, not obviously, I don't want to sound rude. Yeah, there is a way to dye Shell Cordovan because Horween and other companies do dye their shell from the factory, but um, it's not very easy and it's not something that the common person can do at all because Shell is non-porous. So leather dye does not penetrate into the shell and it doesn't stay on. So you might have some... Uh, you know, initial success, but it's just going to wipe off after a couple of sessions. So shell cordovan is one of those materials that you cannot dye like you do calfskin. Okay. There are some really, really talented people like Steve at Beto's. I've seen him dye shell cordovan with pretty good success, but for the most part, it's one of those things that I just really, it's not going to happen, unfortunately. That's why I think shell cordovan is so sought after in these rare colors like, um, like whiskey and bourbon and Ravello because they're just shell cordovan's hard to dye and the companies that do it they they tan the, the leather this way and, and shell cordovan takes months and months to tan so horween it takes like almost a year to tan some shell cordovan and during that process they prepare the the shell they they dye it the color that it's going to be and that process takes a long time and it's not easy so yeah not easy to do on shell cordovan Rishu asked, what is your favorite country for shoe styles and quality? You're a great inspiration. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for your comment. My favorite country that makes shoes. Hmm. I think England would be the most common answer you'll hear out there. Right now, my favorite is Spain. By far. I love Carmina. I love TLB Mallorca. Uh, they're just honestly my favorite country right now. Um, I'm really shocked at what I'm seeing out of Shanghai though. So Gordon, Jim June, Why by Yosal. There's so many others and, I, and I'm sorry that I keep repeating the same ones. But Why by Yosal and Gordon, Jim June, just from what I've seen, are putting out fantastic stuff. And then the Why by Yosal pair I have here is mind blowing. Uh, so I'd say right now Spain is the, the one that's my personal favorite, but Shanghai, I mean, is some people out there are doing great stuff. Connor Walker asked, "If there were to be a viral video on shoe shining, what do you think that, what do you think the video would be about?" A uh, great question. I mean, I don't know what you mean by viral. I have videos with that have kind of gone viral with millions of views. Uh, you know about shoe shining and stuff. I think if it were, I I know, yeah, I think if there were to be like a Netflix series, it would just be about shoe care in general you know it would highlight how the movement started the history of shoes and where it's going now and then highlight some of the big some of the big heavy hitters out there that that deal with this kind of stuff i don't know if i would even come close to that echelon of these high heavy hitters like uh hugo jacome and and others like that so definitely would like to see a viral video maybe a, a series at some point would be pretty cool Wit Witkor Falowski asked, how should I take care of my boots properly in the winter? Great question. Um, during the winter, you're going to encounter a lot of sleet, a lot of snow, a lot of salt because people put salt on their side of the road to get rid of the snow. Um, so yeah, just be prepared to uh, clean your shoes often. Okay, If you get some salt on your, on your leather shoes or your boots, make sure you clean them right away when you get home because salt can actually damage leather pretty profusely. And um, if you ever get some really bad salt stains, there's always this, which is Salt Stain Remover by Saphir. Um, it's a really great product. If you ever need some, you can go to theeleganoxford.com. I sell it. Um, this is just another uh, really good product. Okay, so it's used to remove these white salt marks you might see on shoes. Um, so yeah, just take care of your shoes during, during the winter. Um, if you need to buy like rubber, like those rubber coverings that go over the shoe while you walk, you should probably do that as well. Especially if you have an expensive pair of shoes, you don't want to ruin them. Salt can do a lot of damage to leather if left on there long term. Noel asked, Preston, I don't think you've featured any split toe derbies on your channel. I suspect that you might not like them. How can you sleep at night? I actually am going to feature a split toe derby um, in a future review video. Let me actually show them to you right now and give you a little preview. 
Okay, so I have here, can you see it really well? This is the Velasquez in Brown Museum Calf by TLB Mallorca, and it's just stunning. I've, you're right, I actually haven't been a big fan of split toe derbies, but this shoe right here changed my mind. It is beyond fantastic and it's really beautiful. So I'm gonna be doing a review on this. I have this pair, and I also have this exact other pair in, Brown, in uh, Burgundy Museum Calf. So I'm gonna be doing a review on that, so. I don't want you to block my face, but there we go. Really stunning shoe. So I, I, I am, it's growing on me, so thanks for your question. Andy P asked, how do you keep the wax from clogging up the perforations and the broguing when shining? Uh, another really good question. So when people are learning to do mirror shines for the first time, they find that the broguing on the medallion on the toe gets filled with wax. And what I recommend is that you not use that much wax. If you're getting a really high buildup, you're using a little bit too much wax when you're shining. Use a little bit at a, at a time and build up that shine, which means shoes with medallions are just going to take longer to shine than just a, a shoe with a normal cap toe with nothing on it. That's just how it goes. Um, if you already have some in there, you can always use like a toothpick or a soft rubber toothpick, the ones that are used for uh, braces, and kind of pick it out from there. Or you can use a heat gun to melt it out which will ruin the shine and you'll have to start over. But that's just another option for you if you get too much in there. So use less than you think and uh, you'll be fine. Honesty Dedication asked, are there any shoes that should never be worn with socks? Never is probably too much, too much of a blanket statement. So there are shoes you can wear without socks though pretty much all the time and, and that would probably be boat shoes. So you can wear boat shoes, I'd say reasonably without socks most of the time. Um, now, if you're a little bit more fashion forward, you can wear your loafers without socks. That's a very popular look. So you wear jeans uh, or chinos and no socks, or, or not even no socks, but you wear no-show socks and then your loafers. If you're really hardcore, you can wear your suit and dress shoes without socks. It's not a very common look. Some people hate it. I don't do it, but I did know um, a guy, he was an ultra marathon runner. He was an amazing guy. So he'd, he'd wake up Saturday morning and run 24 hours until Sunday morning at six o'clock. And then he'd finish his 24 hour run, which was a hundred miles. He'd put on his suit and go to church. And he always wore his suit, no socks and his derbies or his Oxfords. Not a look that I think everyone would wear. Some people would think it's not a good look at all, but hey, I, I'm not here to tell anyone what they can or cannot wear. If that's your style, I mean, go ahead. But boat shoes, for sure, you can wear without socks. Um, and uh, some loafers you can wear with no-show socks or no socks. I mean, it's up to you. Walter A, how to achieve a mirror shine without swirl marks? Okay, this is another good question. Some people notice that by the end of their shine, the shine is built up and it's perfect, but they keep getting swirl marks. At that point, you need to switch over to a clean section of the shine cloth and make sure the shine cloth is very, very uh, soft and then you add a little bit of water with rubbing alcohol onto the, the part of the cloth, and then you go over and, and that water alcohol mixture will melt those swirls down and you'll get a clean mirror-like finish, okay? And then you go over it without any water, just dry, and that friction, that heat will melt the wax down, you'll get the glissage, you'll get that mirror finish, it'll all melt down. Granted, it's it's not a science, it's, it's, it's an art, so I, as much as I explain it, sometimes it just doesn't seem to, to work for everybody. Um, but yeah, use water and some rubbing alcohol right at the end with a very clean portion of your shine cloth. If there's already dry wax on there, it might scratch it up and leave swirl marks. All right, Nushan Kodikara. What's your opinion on fake leather? In my country, it's very hard to find real leather for some reason. Artificial leather is peeling after about a year, so the real question is, can we take care of those to an ex to can we can we take care of fake leather to extend the lifetime of it? Um, no, honestly, unfortunately, when it comes to fake leather, um, it, it's not real leather. So it's it's literally plastic or some other type of, of fake material that's that's not skin. So unfortunately, there's really no way to extend the life of it, un unlike leather, which was skin from an animal that was alive at some point, so you can condition it and it'll last forever. I mean, there's leather pieces that are thousands of years old that are still around because leather just lasts forever. I mean, I think reasonably a pair of shoes that's conditioned can last you, f oh, I mean, it could last you 50, I mean, at 50 years. I have pairs of shoes that are almost 100 years old that are still around because they've been conditioned the leather will last a lifetime. 
but unfortunately fake leather is just one of those things that's not the same and uh, it's hard for us as humans to find a replacement material that lasts as long as leather I, I just it's one of those things it's like like honey from a bee bee honey honey just never goes bad I mean they found honey in Egyptian tomes that's still edible and spider silk you know how strong of a natural fiber spider silk is it's like stronger than steel I don't know if you've ever seen how strong a spider silk is. It's incredibly strong. One time I was using a power washer on my car to clean it and there was a spider, a silk strand between my mirror and the car door. And I hit the strand full force with this pressure washer and the strand wouldn't break. It's incredible. Like it was high pressure too. So it's just one of those things. It's natural and uh, it's hard to replicate. So I don't think there's a way to really deal with fake leather. So I, I, I don't recommend it. That's all you have and that's all you have. Make the best you can. Make the best of the situation and wear whatever you can wear. But once it, it cracks or rips, there's no way to really fix it. You're going to have to toss it. Okay. Okay, that was 100 questions. Maybe a little bit mo more or maybe a little bit less. I saw some of the questions were repeated. But it was definitely over 90, 95. So hopefully we hit 100 if anyone wants to count them. I'll try my best to... Uh, write down e each question and then write the timestamp in the description of this video, but I, I can't make any promises. It might be really hard to do that. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed this video and I answered some of your questions. So that was 100 questions answered by me uh, from all of you. So thank you so much for participating in this Q&A. Thanks again for supporting the Elegant Oxford. As always, follow me on Instagram, follow me on Facebook. The links are down below. If you need anything, anything Saphir, anything shoe care, visit theeleganoxford.com and use the code JANFRIENDS for 5% off your order. Thanks again, everyone. I am just, I had a great time. I hope you did too. And this is probably going to be a long video. I know I haven't edited it yet, but so far it's going to be probably an hour, an hour and a half. So everyone have a great rest of your day and I will see you next time. And next time we're going to be having the review series on a, on a pair of shoes called Bridlin. So stay tuned for that. See you next time. Okay, I actually found a couple of bonus questions that I missed here at the end. So I'm just going to answer them now. Silden Shoeshine asked, Are you able to make a living from the Elegant Oxford? If so, how? Yes, I actually am able to make a living from the Elegant Oxford. So I make money from my YouTube videos. I get, you know, YouTube pays you per ad. Uh, through Google AdSense and then I make money from orders that I take for patinas and shine jobs Those are actually what keep me the busiest and there's I just have a lot of requests and I can't get back to everybody And I'm only one person and then I have my online store Which is also another source of income. So yeah, I can survive off the elegant Oxford. I do live in San Diego though So uh, I'm not rich by any stretch of the imagination and uh, the cost of living here is really high, but uh I love San Diego and I'm never leaving, so don't even ask me to do that. Uh, DLE.ELB asked, what is the best color for a long wing? Uh, in my opinion, that would be uh, tan, kind of that cognac color that the classic Florsheim Imperial came in. And uh, the new Alden, you know, the, the Alden long wing also comes in this color. There are other great colors like black and dark brown, but for me, it's just that classic uh, tan cognac color it really puts the shoe together plus it's more of a casual shoe so the two colors really combine great and you can wear it with jeans and, and chinos so it's probably my favorite color uh, but yeah so that's what I think the best color for a long wing is. okay so geom asked best advice as a husband who this is probably gonna be a long answer and I'm not the best husband at all I don't think I don't know sometimes I wonder if I'm even a good husband but uh, I have to, I did learn a lot being single and I've learned a lot being married. So I'll probably share my thoughts about that if any of you are interested in that. So I think the best advice I can offer about being a husband is that it should all start before you're a husband. And what I mean by that is that if you're single, you need to become the best version of yourself and prepare so that you can not find the right spouse it's that you become the right person it's not about finding the right person it's about becoming the right person and once you become the right person finding a good partner is going to be very easy and what i mean by becoming the right person is you need to look inward you have to look inside and be honest and look at all the hurtful and painful stuff that you know needs to change and change it and that takes so many forms 
when I was single, I couldn't find a girlfriend. For at first, I couldn't find a girlfriend, and I just it was so painful. And I was like, why can't I find a girlfriend? I didn't realize that that was a sign that I needed to make changes. If you can't find a girlfriend, if you can't attract a partner, that should be a sign to you that you need to make some changes so that you can become a better version of yourself to attract a partner. That's just the plain truth and it's it's painful and a lot of guys aren't willing to look inward. And if you're listening to this and you're single, you know what needs to change about yourself. Maybe you've had hints of it in your mind that there need to make there need to be some changes made. And it, that takes so many forms. Some guys need to work out. Some guys need to learn to shower daily. Some guys need to get braces. Some guys need to uh, get a job. Some guys need to read books about how to how to talk to, to to girls or how to conduct themselves properly. And that can be really painful admitting that you need work and help. And that was where I was. I just needed to admit that and start improving myself little by little. And that solved the problem. It, it wasn't about finding someone. As soon as I became the right person, I attracted someone who was fantastic, who is fantastic. So that's my advice to you before you're even married is to prepare because marriage isn't easy. And if you're not the best version of yourself, if you're not ready for the long haul, uh, for the good and honorable of th this good and honorable fight you're about to embark in, you're going to lose. And that's the same for everything in life. Like you need to prepare to raise children perhaps and that's not an easy thing either and if your children deserve the best version of you as their father so prepare that's the most important thing and it comes before marriage because if you attract the best possible partner you can attract it's going to make life a lot easier you're probably going to find someone who's like you who's kind and and patient and who works hard and who improves and looks inward and asks questions like maybe i'm wrong a partner, if you're a partner and if you're a good person, your, your partner and you both can can really ask yourselves, maybe I'm the one who's wrong here. It's going to make marriage so much easier. If you're married now and you you are not satisfied in your relationship, I would my my advice would be to work really hard at it. OK, a marriage is like a living person. If 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 my daughter got cancer. My wife and I would fight and do whatever it takes so that our daughter could survive. We'd do everything possible. It's the same with the marriage. If your marriage is sick, do everything you possibly can to make that marriage survive. Go get counseling or whatever. You know, I don't want to get too serious, but do whatever you got to do. If you have to look inward and realize maybe I need to be more patient or more loving or or have to, you know, listen to my what my wife says and do it. Okay, if it's not that bad, if it's just like, how do I make my marriage better? Best advice for husbands is just to, to listen, to be patient, to not lose your temper, to keep the like alive. And that's my saying. People ask me, what does that mean? I, I always tell people, your wife will always love you. That's just the truth. My parents are divorced. They've been divorced for 20 years and they still love each other, but they don't like each other. The like died. So keep the like alive. Keeping the like alive is so so hard that's the challenge is to make sure that you keep the feelings that were first there when you met each other alive forever that sounds cliche everyone's like oh go on dates you don't necessarily have to go on dates you just have to make sure there's no resentment and that you keep the like alive that's if i could i mean if that's that's probably i, I would i'm not i've been married forever i think the secret is to keep the like alive and to be patient and to you know if you're not married marry the best person you can become the best person you can and if you're married give it your best shot and of course if you're in a marriage that's not great i mean i never advocate for divorce but if you're in a really terrible marriage where there's abuse going on or something uh, mental abuse all that stuff i mean i don't ever tell people to get divorced but sometimes ending something is one of the wisest things you can do you know ending something that's not good for you that's damaging you is not it's not good for you but that's just last resort worst case scenario a lot of marriages that are struggling now can be saved if if both partners decide to work at it so hopefully your marriage is not there and this is just not doom and gloom but prepare early become the best version of yourself marry well and then once you're married give it your all and go hard and just <laughs> do the best you can i know that's a long answer and it's probably a little heavy-handed or 
a little more serious than you expected and and uh, i'm not an expert obviously but uh, i really firmly believe what i just told you i really do believe that that there are some essential keys to making a marriage work and to uh, just becoming the best version of yourself overall robin shra asked is a shine ever good enough for you no actually and i'm I hate myself for this. I'm, I'm, I'm like a perfectionist. So sometimes I'll shine a shoe and I, and I won't be satisfied and I'll take forever. And if you've been a customer, if you've been a customer of mine, you'll know I take forever and you probably messaged me because I've taken so long, but I just can't seem to be satisfied with the shine or with the job. I'll be like, Oh, it just, just doesn't look perfect. And I'll go crazy. Uh, so that actually kind of gets me sometimes. I'm just being as honest as I can. Sometimes it really gets to me. I feel like nothing's perfect. So you just have to step back and, you know, be objective. That's kind of what happens to me sometimes. Uh, Matej, this is the last question. Matej Kinkle, hope I pronounced that right, asked, I have a choice between a used pair of Crockett and Jones hand grade and a new pair of Miramin Linea Maestro. Which should I choose? Okay, so both are really great shoes. Crockett and Jones hand grade are really fantastic shoes. They're made from really, really, really great leather. Someone actually donated a pair to me and the leather is phenomenal. Uh, one of the, some of the best leather I've ever felt. I, I guess it would all come down to how used the Crockett and Jones hand grade are. Because if they're really, really used or if they're not in great condition, I'd go with the Miramine Linea Maestro. If it's in good condition, uh, it would come down to price. How, how much are you gonna pay? If you're gonna pay $600, maybe 500, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would pay $500 for a hand grade Crockett and Jones uh, that are used. Uh, but if they're like $200, for sure Crockett and Jones. But if you're going to buy a, a, a new shoe, Miramin Linea Maestro is hard to beat. And here's why. The, the Linea Maestro, they come with JR soles from the factory. And they're uh, closed channel stitched. So it's just a really nice fine detail. I've worked on a couple of pairs and they have really pronounced welt fudging, really nice fine details. And the best part of all is that they're hand welted as opposed to Goodyear welted. And not even the hand grade Crockett and Jones line is, is hand welted. So hand welted as for those who don't know, is when the shoe is, is actually, uh, when the sole is stitched to the welt by hand. So there's a, 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 a artisan actually stitching by hand instead of using a Goodyear welt stitching machine. So it's just, it's the next step up and usually hand welted shoes at minimum cost six, seven hundred dollars. So Miramin Linea Maestro starting at a three hundred is fantastic. They are made in China, obviously, if that even matters to you. But overall, I'd say that if I had to choose one, if brand new is, you know, Crockett and Jones, Crockett and Jones, I'd probably choose Crockett and Jones. But if it was between used and, and a new pair, I'd probably go to Miramin Linea Maestro. So you can't go wrong with either. I really like hand lasted shoes, hand welted shoes. So Miramin. You know, I don't care if they're made in China. I think they're fantastic shoes. Not perfect, but for 300 bucks, you're not going to find a better deal out there. It's one of the best deals in the shoe world.